Good day to everyone out there on Facebook and YouTube. I hope you're having a great day. And I'm so glad that you've joined us today as we talk about a controversial topic in the world today, family. Sometimes our memories of family aren't that good. Sometimes our mem memories of family are fantastic. But we're going to be diving into what the book of Proverbs says about family. And we're going to start by reading Proverbs 22, 1 to 6. A good name is to be chosen rather than riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. The prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches, honor, and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the crooked. Whoever guards his soul will keep far from them. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray that you'd be honored in this time. You'd be given glory and a Holy Spirit that you would use this message to exalt your name. And Lord, I pray for just open hearts, but also, O Lord, that we'd be changed and transformed people focused upon the power of the gospel and the glory of God. Just thanks for your word. In Jesus' good name, amen. We have lots of dysfunctional family examples in our culture, and it seems that every TV show that's out there that focuses on the family is filled with dysfunction. And I've posted some of those on the screenshot of this video of dysfunctional families that are exalted by our culture. Well, what does a dysfunctional family look like? I looked on the Google and it gave me eight things. A dysfunctional family does not communicate. It lacks empathy. It's prone to addiction. A dysfunctional family has lots of mental issues, controlling behavior, con uh, parents that demand perfectionism, people that are critical, and a lack of independence and privacy. While we have not too many positive examples on TV, how we would get from family. And we have less positive examples sometimes in real life. Where on earth can we get direction from family about concerning from the Lord? Proverbs actually speaks a lot, and I mean a lot, about family life. In fact, no book in the Bible speaks more about family than the book of Proverbs. Although many books, specific, specifically 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, they focus on sometimes speaking about negative families and negative aspects of family. Proverbs gives us positive encouragement about what family is all about. Now, we're not going to deal with the husband and wife and the aspect of family in this sermon. We've already tackled that topic in Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 when we talked about sexual purity in marriage. We're going to look at the aspect of family life in the book of Proverbs as it relates to parents and children, children with parents, and children or siblings with each other. Now, I know this topic of parenting and family life in Canada and even in the church, can be controversial. In Canada, we can't even pin down really what a family is. I was told by someone who worked closely with National Parks Canada, said that they had to change their family pass to what they call a group pass because nobody could uh, define and come to an agreement on what is family. I also happen to know how controversial parenting can be. But the problem with many opinions that you hear about parenting these days, even in the church, of much of what is held to has nothing to do with the Bible. Often it relates to faulty psychological or psychological opinions, or sometimes it's just plain what I call opinionology, people's opinion, opinions about things. My advice on parenting advice, if you're going to give advice, Make sure it's coming from the Word of God, and it's not the Word of man. Often as well, what people do is if they don't like someone, they take their anger out on a person on how they parent, and it becomes another form of malice and bitterness and hatred. Trust me on this one. It's a lot easier to pull the speck out of someone else's eye 
than the log out of your own eye. So we need all to have a spirit of humility as we address this topic of parenting in the Bible. Again, and like other topics in Proverbs, the book of Proverbs does not deal with topics in a category fashion. But Proverbs speaks about family life all throughout this book, in the book of Proverbs, many times, many verses. So we have five facts about God's design for family in the book of Proverbs. Number one, God's design is for harmony in family. Number two, we deal with this son that's used, twen- uh, th- this, this phrase, my son, that is used 22 times in parents, teach your children. Number three, parents discipline your children. Number four, parents live a godly example for your children. And number five, children obey your parents. Let's look at number one. God's design for family is harmony. Now, how many families do you know have serious discord in, discord in them? How many families do you know that have siblings that do not talk to each other or parents that don't talk to their children? This is sad, sad, sad. And if it's all Christians involved, this is ungodliness. Remember going back to the famous verse in the book of Proverbs chapter 6 with the seven things that the Lord hates? We, we seem to never get to the seventh. And the seventh thing that the Lord hates in Proverbs 6 verse 19 is one who sows discord among the brothers. Now some people often interpret that word brother here to refer to a more of a generic brother, meaning any human being. But in the context of Proverbs, every time this word brother is used relates to blood brothers and close relatives. So what Proverbs is getting at here is creating strife in family or between siblings or close relatives, this the Lord hates. Creating this strife among family is alongside of lying, pride, murder, and people who run to do evil. I think if we heard that clearly, we'd be less to have strife in our families. Proverbs speaks several times about the danger of sowing discord. This is a person who stirs up controversy, the sowing discord, and it's not referring to the person whom you, who's, who's kind of telling a cheap joke at your, at your expense or trying to create healthy discussion. These are people who want to create a dishonest or an honest division, and sometimes they even are dishonest. But hatred stirs up strife, like the proverb says, and it's the same word as discord here used in Proverbs 10 verse 12. Hatred stirs up strife or discord, but love covers all offenses. And we see how wicked people behave. As it says in Proverbs 6, 12 to 14, and wicked, a wicked man sows discord. Here Proverbs 6, 12 to 14. A worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech, winks with his eyes, signals with his feet. I wonder what that looks like. Points with his finger. With a perverted heart, he devises evil, continually sowing discord. A wicked person sows discord. These are some pretty hard truths. And we ought to consider our ways with this one. Because sowing discord in family is put alongside of some very serious sins. We who have siblings and family know they're never perfect. They never are, and and neither are we. But we often are so quick to acknowledge uh, their sinfulness and very slow to acknowledge our own sinfulness and imperfections. Again, it's easy to have the sin of someone else in the spotlight while you're hoping that your sins remain in the dark. There's some things that we need to consider with reference to family. First thing, seems weird to ask, but I've heard this before. Do you wish your family was dead? Do you wish harm upon family members? Do you wish to do physical violence to them? Do you speak ill of them with the intent to harm them with your words? If your answer is yes, you need to repent of your sin. 
And I'm not saying that right now that you should go and be the best buds with your parents or your siblings who maybe have done you harm. But at least show the same amount of grace to family that the Lord Jesus has shown to you. I recognize that family is complicated. Of course, because we're a bunch of sinners together who are family. But it's not nearly as complicated as what Jesus Christ had done for each one of us. Jesus Christ paid the punishment for our sins. We offended God the Father and God was gracious and He sent us lovingly His Son to pay the punishment for our sins. And He, this death was brought, brings about in our hearts and lives ought to stir us to not only obedience but to forgiveness. Today, if you have bitterness in your heart towards a family member, or even broad, well, just broadly speaking, any person, make amends and seek forgiveness and restoration in Jesus Christ. And let's go to number two. My son, my son, parents teach your children. In Proverbs, the author calls out to their son or their sons 22 times with this phrase, my son. I'm going to read almost a dozen of them. Proverbs 1.8 My son, listen to me. Do not forsake my teaching. 1.10 Proverbs My son, if sinners entice you, don't go along with them. If they're calling you to go down the road of sin, my son, don't go there. Proverbs 1.15 My son, do not walk in the way of sinners. Do not walk with sinners. Proverbs 2 verse 1 my son, receive my words, and my son, treasure them. Proverbs 3, verse 1. My son, don't forget my teaching. Proverbs 4, verse 10. My son, accept my words. Proverbs 4, 20. My son, be attentive to my words. Proverbs 5, verse 1. My son, be attentive to my words and incline your ear to understanding. And in Proverbs 5, 20, 6, verse 1, and 7, verse 1. My son, he says it three times, avoid sexual immorality. Proverbs 24, verse 21, my son, fear the Lord and fear the king. Proverbs 27, verse 11, my son, be wise. You get the impression that these parents are crying out to their child, to their son, listen to my words, or in essence, listen to wisdom which is from God. The father and mother make serious pleas to their children that they flee sin, they stay away from sin. And this needs to be a serious plea for our children. We ought to be turning them to the Lord, teaching them about the wisdom of the Lord. But as well, we need to be in teaching them the Word of God and calling them back to the Word of God and encouraging them not to flee and to go into sin and not to flee into wickedness, but to flee sin and flee the rebellion against their Lord. Let's look at number three. Parents, discipline your children. Now, maybe nothing is more controversial than the, how we discipline our children in our culture and probably it's probably the most controversial topic in Proverbs, maybe at least one of them. Some people think it's a sin to spank their child, and others think it's a sin uh, that if you do not spank your child. I remember there was a guy who always came to my parents' restaurant with a stack of articles and books of the reasons why you shouldn't spank your children and many people like this guy said if you spank your children you're making them violent now i came from the generation of spanking and virtually every friend i have and had was spanked not one of my friends to my knowledge ever was violent but I know many people who were not spanked who are extremely violent. So I just don't buy that spanking automatically promotes violence and is going to create your child to be violent. In fact, I know a guy who said it was wrong to spank kids and he ended up punching his child in the face. But obviously here, when you look at the Proverbs, when often the authors talk about the discipline of children, it's not exclusively to spanking or disciplining with a rod. 
there's really five main references to disciplining your disciplining your children in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 13, 24, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. 19, 18, discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. Proverbs 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 23, verse 13, do not hold, withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. Proverbs 29, verse 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. People hearing these verses, they might want to cancel the book of Proverbs. People listening might want to cancel this sermon, but the Lord commands us to discipline our children. We never act out in anger. We never abuse. We never act in rage when we do that. Proverbs never advocates the abuse of children at all. If you think it ha it does, you've misread this whole book. We must discipline in the mode of love. All things must be done in the mode of love. Tremper Longman, who's written the, uh, the most extensive commentary, or one of, on the book of Proverbs, writes, It's difficult to inflict discomfort of any kind upon a child that one loves. However, this command points out that more harm is done to a child by withholding discipline than by applying it. And he's right. Even looking past the spanking or the rod issue of discipline of your child, teaching and correcting them with the word of God is what as well Proverbs has in mind here. You can start by when your children disobey you. You can ask, why are you dishonoring your parents? Because you're breaking God's law. And God is a holy God. But what I've observed in our culture is two extremes. Really, sometimes people do get abusive with their children. And sometimes people, they just there's no discipline at all. We can be balanced and discipline our kids in love and speak to them in love. Because God is love and he commands discipline. Those who are struggling with Proverbs, what they're saying here, do you struggle with what Proverbs says about God and Him disciplining us? God loves us, and because He loves us, He disciplines us. This is also talked about in the book of Hebrews. But here, Proverbs 3, where Hebrews is quoting, 3.11 and 12, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of His reproof. For the Lord reproves him who He loves as a father the son in whom he delights. If God did not love us, he would not discipline us. End of story. So now we can go to our fact number four about family life. And this is going to be the hard one. Parents, live a godly example. Of course, the greatest way to teach your children about the Lord is to be an example of what it means for the Lord. We see this in other areas. Parents do things and children latch onto it. A pastor friend of mine talks about this all the time. Being in Toronto, he knows. He says, no one in their right mind would ever be a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. They consistently put out losing teams year after year. They've done it for 50 years. They constantly give away the best players for a bag of pucks. And they pay too much money for lousy players. Yet the Maple Leafs have tons of fans. They consistently put out losing teams and they have just piles of fans and people that will just sink money into watching them and buying merchandise. Now, if you can get a child to love a losing team like the Maple Leafs, certainly you can get them interested in the Lord Jesus, who's king and ruler over the universe. And I fully understand that it's God's providential work in salvation. You cannot save your child. You cannot make your child a Christian. But hopefully you get the point. Is what we prioritize as parents, your children see. But the problem for many in the church or lots in the church, is that their love for the Maple Leafs or even hockey or for anything else other than the Lord often exceeds their love for those things, often exceeds their love for the Lord. In Ontario, if church was going to be at any other time other than Sunday, you would never want it on the time that a Maple Leafs game would be played 
because many churchgoers might be tempted to skip. But often our children prioritize what we have prioritized. If we do not prioritize Jesus, it teaches our children that they do not need to prioritize Jesus. If you don't prioritize the gathering of believers, they're not going to see it as a something that's important. If you don't prioritize the reading of the Word of God in your life and with them, they're not going to see a need for it. And that's the primary way in which we hear God and have a relationship with Him. Many people have prioritized hockey. And you know what? The least, they have an energetic fan base. But we as followers of Jesus are commanded to exalt the Lord with our lives and truly follow the Lord and prioritize Him. And we need to be praying that our children have a fan base for Jesus in essence and love Him and lay down their lives to follow Him. Proverbs, though, speaks many times about how we as parents are to live. We're to walk in integrity. Proverbs 20, verse 7. The righteous who walks in his integrity... Blessed are his children after him. If you walk in integrity, your children will be blessed if you're righteous. Proverbs as well says it's better to be poor and to walk with the Lord than be crooked and a fool. Proverbs 19.1 Better a poor person who walks in his integrity than one who is crooked in speech and is a fool. And this command of exalting the Lord is talked about as well in the book of Ephesians. Where it speaks to fathers in Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And now we come to our fifth point in the book of Proverbs. Children, obey your parents. For the children here, this one might be a painful one for you, but you ought and you must, by God's command, Obey your parents. Proverbs speaks actually again many times about the honor and the respect that children ought to give to their parents. Proverbs 19.26 He who does violence to his father and chases away his mother is a son who brings shame and reproach. Is that the kind of child you want to be who brings shame and reproach? Proverbs 20.20 If one curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out in utter darkness. You will experience God's judgment. Proverbs 23, verse 22. Listen to your father who gave you life. Do not despise your mother when she is old. Here, that command relates to when your parents are old. Do you hear that? We're not to disrespect our parents. Even when we're older and when you're younger, we ought to listen to them and to their teaching. This command goes all the way back to the book of Exodus and the Ten Commandments. It is commandment number five. Exodus 20, verse 12. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. And Paul talks about this verse, this same command in the book of Colossians and Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6, 1 to 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise that it may go well. What's the promise? That it may go well with you and you may live long in the land. Notice that your wealth and health is dependent upon you obeying and respecting your parents. In Colossians 3 verse 20, Children, obey your parents in everything, for it pleases the Lord. It's so simple. You want to please the Lord? Obey your Christian parents. I know when I was a child, I thought my parents were trying to kill all my joy. All these rules and regulations, they had things that had to be obeyed. And I often sometimes thought that these rules were ruining my life. But as I look back on how hard they were, in my mind back then, they were only hard. They were by no means hard. They were saving me from many foolish, stupid, and serious decisions that led to serious and stupid and foolish mistakes. Thank God for my parents. We obey our parents because we're commanded to by the Lord. We obey our parents because this pleases the Lord. Now I know in our culture if you submit to someone it's seen as you're weak or you're a fool because you should just have free reign for whatever you want to do. 
but that goes against God's word. Not in this case. This is wisdom, and this is joy, and this is peace. Obedience to our parents. Well, we've ta- tackled the five facts of family in the book of Proverbs. We just have three points of application to our lives. And I will speak to parents first. Parents, we need to live the gospel. Parents, our greatest need is not the next self-regulation book to mindful lives, as our society would teach us. And I looked at some of the top 10 parenting books right now, and it was amazing how many of the titles of the books I cannot even read to my child in swear words and vulgarity. We're, we're talking about parenting here. What our children need is not all that nonsense. But we need to point them to Jesus by living out the gospel of Christ. Children as well. This is well what you need. The gospel of Jesus Christ. First, acknowledge and you need to live out that God is a holy God. You need to know and you need to live out that God is a holy God who hates sin. And you need to acknowledge and know and experience that God sent his son to you in love. To take the punishment for your sins so you could have peace with God, forgiveness, a wiped out slate because of all the evil you've committed. And we need to live lives that treasure Jesus Christ above all things by turning from your sin, trusting, leaning, and throwing yourself upon the Lord Jesus so that we can receive mercy and grace from God. If you see no need for the grace of Jesus in your life, don't expect your kids to see grace, the need for the grace of Jesus, and the death and resurrection of Jesus, they'll see no need for that. They won't see those things as valuable if you don't. If your attitude is much like my parents, old mechanic who put this sign in his office, it's not good by the way, it said two important things you need to know about working for me. Number one, the boss is always right. Number two, when the boss is wrong, refer to number one, the boss is always right. If you're filled with pride and arrogance and you think you're always right and perfect and you show no sign of humility before Jesus Christ, don't expect your children are going to humble themselves before the Lord and to trust in Christ. We need to be parents who not only say this with all their hearts, but live out 1 Timothy 1, 15-16. Now, I know this is speaking about Paul the Apostle, but this is really the practical application of the gospel. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. This is why Jesus came, to save people like me, sinners, and I'm the foremost of sinners. Verse 16, but I receive mercy for this reason. Remember, mercy is something that's received, that in me as a foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example of, to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. Hear that? Receiving the grace of Christ, humility, and then you're an example. And that's the outworking of the gospel in your life. Next, parents teach the gospel. In our Canadian culture, there is a spiritual battle. Maybe like none we've ever seen before. There's a battle for the minds of our children. And our Canadian culture is completely against the Lord Jesus. Although you might ask a lot of people what they think about Jesus, they might be okay with it. They certainly do not like much of what Jesus stood for in his word. Spend time with your child, yes, but more importantly, spend time with your child teaching them about the Lord Jesus. Turn off the TV and plug the Wi-Fi. Do whatever you can to get them focused upon the Lord Jesus. Tell them the stories of Jesus. Make this your everyday routine. Again, the gospel found in Luke 24, 46 to 47. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. There's a good four or five week lesson there with your children that you can teach them the gospel. Prioritize Jesus and his good work to your children with your actions and your words. And finally, children love Jesus by obeying your parents. How many times when I disobeyed my parents, it brought me more pain and suffering? Virtually almost all the time. But children, you're to obey your parents. It pleases the Lord. Your Christian parents are not there to destroy or ruin your life. 
They're laying down these boundaries for your benefit. And trust me, there's greater joy and obedience to Jesus and the freedom that you think you're going to get uh, from rebellion against the Lord. How we love Jesus is by obeying Him. And how we love Jesus in this part is by submitting and respecting and loving your parents. I pray that we would be people who live out parents and children, who live out the gospel, share the gospel, and obey God's word to his glory. Amen.